You're listening to the Black Eagles podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is episode 225 of the Black Eagles podcast. And of course, I am your host, Sinan Schwarting, live from a wow, quite rainy, like almost like monsoon like New York City. They say April, fl- April showers bring May flowers, right? <laughs> As usual, my weather metaphor extends all the way into the Besiktas realm. Rain being a pretty good metaphor for what we just experienced. Um, let's let's talk about it a little. I guess first of all, as far as the news goes, there's not a ton of it. Um, I, there's talk of like Koray Gunter, right, uh, Turkish central defender. Perhaps we have our eye on. Beyond that, still lots of Sorloth talk. You know, rumors of Abubakar and uh, Talishka now. You know, Fener looking at them. Talishka rumored to have said he's happy where he is at Al Nasser. If they both go to Fener, of course, the old Al Nasser Fenerbahce conspiracy theory will come alive again. But we don't need to go there right now. We're, we're content with where we are. We have a new coach who's done well so far. We're, we're looking forward to this offseason of, of making the right moves, smart moves. We don't, we don't need to be splashy. But so with that said, let's talk about here and now. Let's talk about our match against Giresun. Operation is in effect as of right now. Yes, Giresun. Um, so I guess first of all, I, I thought it was actually quite interesting. And I took note of this. It was the night before our match, and I didn't. I didn't post it anywhere because I didn't want to, you know, uh, to be blamed for jinxing us or anything of that sort. But in our in the last six matches of the Super League, the team in the best form, of course, is Antalya Spor, who have just won the last six. Then Fener, who we all know are on a hot streak. Then in third place was Giresun Spor who had won four, drawn once, and won once. So, you know, that felt like it was definitely worth paying heed to, right? All right, let's talk about some of those results. So, uh, they beat Gostepe, 3-1. to one. They beat Rize in a sort of relegation scrum, 1-2 to two on the road. They beat Gaziantep at home, 2-1. to one. They lost to the indomitable Antalya Spor, right? Tough team to play against these days. 4-1. to one. So they lost on the road there. And then they drew Sivas at home, 2-2. Two two. Sivas, you know, they can always pose a threat. They're having a bit of an off year, honestly, but even still, they've, they've caused trouble for a lot of sides. And then they're fresh off of a victory on the road against Malatya. Malatya basically guaranteed to go down now. Uh, and I think that played a part in it. But so, like I said, quite good form coming into this match. So that would be ominous. Besiktas in fifth place in that in that table, actually. Having two wins, three draws, and a loss in the last six. So not terrible stuff, right? That's what you could counter anything, any negative thoughts with. It's worth noting that our only competitive match against Gidersun in recent history was a loss to Gidersun. And I talked about it in our last episode. We lost nil to four at Vodafone Park. So, kind of crazy stuff. Definitely caught us all off guard. It was at the height of the uh, collapse of the Sergen Yalcin regime. So, I guess it shouldn't be particularly surprising, perhaps. 
Oh, so let's talk about this sucker. Right? The lineups, first of all, for us, Ederson in the goal, Montero, Vida, and Nijip on the back line. Of course, uh, I think Wellington uh, was carded out of the last match, right, with the red, so he's suspended. On the wings, the wing backs, Ridvan and Valentin Rosier, and in the middle, John Bozdoan and Joseph de Souza, with Rashid Gazal and Alex Teixeira on the flanks, with Michi Batshuayi in the middle. No real surprises. Uh, perhaps not even Nejip playing instead of Serdar Saji, just given his experience and all of that, right? So where does that leave us? I guess it leaves us with Girison's lineup, right? So they have Okan Koju, 26-year-old keeper, name many might recognize. On their back line, Sergen Pichingio, 26-year-old Turk, next to Alexis Perez, a 28-year-old Colombian. Left back, Aziz Behic, 31-year-old Australian Turk. Opposite, Hyrula Bilazer, 26-year-old Turk. In their midfield, Hamidou Traore, 25-year-old Malian central defender. Next to Flavio, 26-year-old Brazilian. And up ahead of them, 26-year-old Portuguese Chiquinho. And on their wings, Magomed Chapi Suleimanov, 22-year-old Russian right winger. Opposite Serginho, 27-year-old Brazilian. Up top, a name many will recognize, Mehmet Umut Nair, former Besiktas striker. Yeah, so that's that's it, right? Um, I don't know. Like, not a particularly formidable side. Lots of interesting names we wouldn't recognize. Although, again, right? Like, not over the hill guys. Like, 25, 26 year olds. They've done some scouting. You know, some. It's it's always good to see teams that are are doing something differently for you know for what that's worth. But so let's dig into the match itself. Of course, the first action of the match, a yellow card for Nejip in the ninth minute, and we would have our first chance shortly thereafter. Rashid Ghazal, some fancy footwork, bringing him to sort of the right edge of the penalty box, and he'd send in a curling shot, saved fairly comfortably, if we're going to be honest, by Okan Koji. In the 15th minute, a corner kick would be defended out by Perez, Alexis Perez. It would drop to the head of Montero, who would wisely head it into the path of Mishibachuai, and he would actually do well to sort of put it onto his chest, sort of spin on a dime, and send in a powerful low shot on goal. This one was particularly well saved, but that would be... Um, the extent of it for us. That was in the 17th minute. In the 15th minute, actually, he'd actually just saved a shot of theirs off of the line as well on a corner. So Montero had a nice little stretch there in the first, like, 15 minutes, at least as far as the, these chances go. Big highlight plays. Uh, Sergen Pichingio for them would get a yellow card after the, the chance that we had, that Mishibachuai had saved. It was actually a really good chance. It wasn't offside. Would have held up. I mean, it would have been a fantastic goal. And so, yeah, a big chance saved, I guess you could say, right? By uh, Okan Kojuk. And then for there, from there would be a stretch of quiet, you know, half chances. Not much going on, honestly. Back and forth. Besiktas having the, a really long run of possession, but not really looking comfortable with it. And I think, in a way, our team isn't built to hold the ball that much, with only two midfielders in the center, for example, right? But, um, you know, that's like plan A, and we didn't revert to a plan B for this one. And I think, on the one hand, you can say, oh, you know, the coach is stubborn, and this is what he came under fire for with West Brom a little bit, was being a little stubborn with his plan A. On the other hand, you could also argue this is his third match, uh, and he wants to sort of hammer home that plan A and get the guys comfortable playing in it, first and foremost. So, you know, 
there are arguments to be had on either side of that, I suppose. But anyway, in the 43rd minute, um, a long shot from distance by Rashid Ghazal. I think it was credited as being saved by Okan Kojuk in the end. Um, it looked like it grazed the top of the bar a little too. Kind of, both of those chances kind of flew under the radar for me personally. For B and USA, they had no announcer, which was weird. But so the result of that was like no no one screaming to let you know that a big chance was incoming or whatever it was. So yeah, um, two chances. One of them sort of conjured out of nothing by Rashid Gazal. The other one, I mean, also like well played by Bachwe. But on the other hand, you maybe hope he would have done better given the lack of chances for the most part and how how good that one looked in retrospect. But so that's it for the half. No subs at halftime for either side. In the 47th minute, a chance. It would be Serginho for them. Who would make a nice little run. Valentin Rosier, uh, sort of dud of a sliding tackle. He was off for some of this. He had some flashes of promise as well. So, you know, I think he did some things well. Especially statistically, he might even be well rated for it. Because of his, like... You know, generally accurate passing, stuff like that. But then he was also a little sloppy with his dribbling and stuff that maybe wouldn't translate statistically. So, I mean, we'll see see how that measures up in the end. But anyway, a poor tackle from him. He misses. And uh, this dude keeps making a run. Sends in a pretty nice sort of like panenka. You know, he's outside of his foot sort of cross in that is cleared. And it cleared relatively poorly. To, I don't remember to whom. And if there's a shot on target, Erickson does quite well to save. And yeah, we're, we're still at nil-nil. And this isn't looking great. In the 50th minute, they have another chance. Erickson um, passing the ball to Vida out of the back. Domagos Vida with a really sloppy pass back. This sh- um, Shapiro, Shapi Suleimanov. Guy, guy gets onto the other side of it, sends in a pretty nice sh- sh- chance, a nice shot, but it's it's too easy for Erison to, to get onto the other end of. And again, still nil nil, 50th minute, and they are the ones kind of pushing, although not really, only one real decent chance out of that bunch there. But so accurately here, we at the right time we get a sub. 55th minute, two subs in fact, and Kudu on for Alex Teixeira. And Mirele Mpjanic on for John Bozduan. And honestly, I think these are exactly the right subs. You know, if you're keeping this tactic, you might, again, think it might be time to revert to a plan B. But again, if you're arguing that he's trying to hammer home plan A first before you start playing with it. Okay, fair enough. In that regard, I think these are the right subs. I think you could say Atiba might have a place over Pjanic. But on the other hand, Pjanic offers more... With that, like, final pass, you know, um, given our struggle to sort of connect the midfield to attack, we all know his ability to, to create something out of nothing on a dime. So that's the logic there. And, of course, Nkudu as well, you know, a little pace, a little speed. It might take advantage of one of those passes. So good subs as far as I'm, as far as I'm concerned. 64th minute, Ibrahima Balde comes on for Ulut Nair. 77th minute, Umut Merash for Ridvan and Guven Yalchin for Mishi Bachwai. And that, you know, that's that's where my, I'm maybe not on board. I, I get perhaps Umut Merash, Ridvan. Generally, everyone was a little clumsy and stumbling around and it looked like they were playing slow mo a lot and they were dribbling into groups and kind of hoping for lucky bounces. You know, not good, technically proficient football by any stretch. Um, so, fine, you know, if you want to put in Umut Mirash for a little energy along the flank, uh, that's okay. But I don't think ba- Bachuay needs to come out of this one. Um, they've pressed hard all match, and I think at this point they're starting to tire and you feel like Besiktas could break through. So you really want that guy who kind of individually can make that happen out there, right? So taking him off, questionable as far as I'm concerned. So I have here my cat skittering around on the floor, fooling around with something. Um, 77th minute, Mohamed Gumushkaya comes on for Serginho, who had created a bit of a problem for us earlier. Zeki Yavru on for Magomed Shapi Suleimanov in the 89th minute. Man had also created a few little problems for us. 
an extra min, an extra like the only real highlight that, like left here was in extra time at the very end of extra time, 93rd minute. Joseph de Souza sends on Unkudu quite well. Unkudu runs onto it, sends in a pretty decent cross actually. All things considered, he kind of gets behind the back line, loops it in. And it drops to Guven perfectly, and I don't know what he's thinking. He, like, falls back. Perhaps he thinks he's close enough to the ball where he can do this and kind of still flick the ball forward. You know, maybe fake out the, the keeper thinking he's falling and then still get the... You know, whatever his logic is, it doesn't come off at all. He doesn't get the shot off. I don't know if he's flopping, like, looking for a penalty, but, you know, whatever it is, it's an L. And, yeah, nil-nil. One of the most boring matches of the season, no doubt. I mean, on the one hand, where the question was answered as far as can Besiktas play this way and dominate possession, they did. 69% of the ball to get us in 31%. 14 shots to their 9. 4 on target to their 3. However, so, you know, shots from distance, shots that weren't particularly effective. I don't think anyone came away from this feeling like we really, like, overwhelmingly deserved three points. All in all, I think the best chance in this match is the Bachuai turn and shot on goal, which is that's also the best save of the match, for sure, by Okan Kojuk. But they maybe had more better chances, right? That little stretch at the beginning of the second half created two really decent chances for them. Could have gone either way. So yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, really it's like, I think two good chances for us. If you count that shot from Rashid Ghazal from distance, maybe three, but uh, you know, two solid chances for them as well, so whatever. End of the day, probably a deserved draw. Gidison is playing tough, really fighting to stay up in the Super League. Credit to them for it. I mean, they were defending heavily. They were pressing hard all over the pitch. Uh, but staying behind the ball at all times in numbers. So, you know, credit to them. That was their game plan. They stuck with it. We held the ball for much of it. So we showed we can do that. Uh, and, and I don't feel like, you know, I didn't feel like we were in a significant amount of danger at any point. So in a way, our tactic is still working as far as this. You know, feeling better having those three guys back in case of uh, the occasional error here and there. You know, someone is usually able to come back and recover for us. But, you know, lots to be asking for as well in this one, certainly. So let's dig into these stats, right? Big chances, only one. It was the best touch. I'm guessing it was the Bachuai shot. Big chances missed, one. Accurate passes, 517 to their 171, an 83% rate for us to their 60%. So, certainly at least, again, you know, if you're looking for a silver lining, it's that we can still play a certain way as far as holding the ball and passing it around a lot at a, at a, at a high clip, too, of efficiency. Um, only one big chance that went our way as well, you know, statistically anyway. So, some positives perhaps, but eh, if that's only if you're really looking for them. They actually had six shots inside the box, and we only had three, for example. So even though we had 14 to their nine, and four shots on target to their three, they had more shots inside the box. That said, they were defended well, or off target, or saved, so in the end, yeah, you know. Individual stats. Let's talk a little bit about them. So, all the players rated above 7 from the best to the worst of the best. Uh, on top was Flavio, their defensive midfielder. And then Nejip, our central defender. Uh, and then Sergen Picingio, their central defender. Okan Kojuk, their keeper. That save against Ishibachuai definitely is what gave them a point in the end. Then Alexis Perez. Then John Bozdoan, which is interesting. I thought he played pretty poorly. Then Montero, who had his ups and downs. Some some casual errors, but then some really good play as well. Then Rashid Gezal. 
Ersin Destanolu, Hamidu Traore, Mehmet Umut Nair, Valentin Rosier. Yeah, that's what I thought. He was rated highly, but I think we can all agree it was not a great day for him. Then Joseph de Souza, Aziz Behic, and then Hairula Bilazer is the last dude. They're right back. Pjanic, not quite, didn't quite make the cut at 6.94. But so pretty evenly split there. Our highest rated player was Nejip, interestingly. I don't know who I would give our man of the match to. I guess I'm going to go with Montero. I'm going with Francisco Javi Montero. Uh, and just specifically because he saved a, a shot off the line. I'm not sure Erson couldn't have gotten to, but he didn't need to. Because uh, Montero played heads up. And then on, like almost the next play on the counter to that, he came back and almost headed the assist really cleverly too. Um, into the path of Mishiba Chuai, who... Could have put that one away. That could have been it for the match. So, for what could have been, I suppose I'll give it to Montero. And also because he was a central defender in a, um, you know, shutout, right? Clean sheet. Let's look at his statistics. He played a full 90 minutes. 79 out of 99 with his passes. 80%. One key pass. And a big chance created. Like I said, it was that header. He had 113 touches. And so this is also why I'm giving it to him. He was all over the pitch. You know, he was really trying to be as involved as possible. It was an ugly game with lots of clattering tackles and people bouncing balls around. So in that sense, his being so intrepid was quite positive for us. Um, two of eight for, for his long ball. So that, that contributed to his um, poor passing numbers. I mean, not poor. 80% is not bad, but... Um, but yeah, lots of long balls, 2 of 8. Also 0 for 3 on crosses. So he was, especially late in the game, trying to pump it into the box. So he didn't care about his stats, right? He was trying to do everything he could to get us that win in the end. So I'll, credit, I'll, I'll give him credit. It wasn't a great stellar performance by any stretch. It was a, just a good central defender's performance in a match that wasn't really stellar for anyone. And I think you could have probably given it... I, I'm not going to give it to Vita because he had that poor pl- pass back that almost... You know, gave give them a chance needlessly anyway. Uh, and Nejip, I mean, let's look at his numbers just out of curiosity because he is the highest rated player in the match. His passing is incredibly accurate. 58 of 64 at a 91% rate. Two key passes. Um, he had a shot. It was on target. He had 74 touches, so not nearly as omnipresent as uh, our friend Montero. But still, you know, pretty involved. One for one with his dribbles. Four of five with his long balls. And didn't take as many risks. He wasn't coming forward, especially like later on. I think Montero is the guy, because he has more ability passing the ball, who typically will step forward and help out a little uh, of our back three. Um, yeah, I mean, two blocks, a clearance, six recoveries. Yeah, good numbers for, for both these guys. Montero had eight recoveries, by the way, two clearances. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. All around, just a kind of meh performance. Not much to really get excited about in any regard. The stats underlie that, right? Lots of defenders and defensive midfielders among and keepers in that, you know, top 10 or what have you. Top 15. But so that's all we got for this match. I'm trying to keep it brief here because there's not a whole lot to say about it. But, Results are not fantastic for us, obviously, only getting a point out of this. All of our rivals seem to drop points. Alanya lost to Antalya, 1-3. to three. Adana Demir lost to Kais- K- uh, Kasim Pasha, 4-0. Basakshi here drew Altai, 1-1. One one. Konya with a victory, but we can kind of root for that. We're hoping maybe they'll pass Travis on. <laughs> it's a miracle collapse. Fener also won. So, I mean, basically, second and third are all 10 points back. Fourth place is still only three points away, even despite us getting only the draw. Um, so, let's run through it. So, Trabzon is in first, of course, with 73 points. They drew again, so they could choke. If they if they only manage a couple more draws and, and, and lose a few, they, they really might. I mean, Fener is hot at this point. And Konya had a big win, 4-1, to one, against Gaziantep. Uh, but so yeah, in fourth place, which is what we're kind of going for at this point, is Bashakshi here with 54 points. Then Adana Demirspor and Alanya Spor with 52 points. And then us in seventh place with 51 points. 
And now with Antalya Sports, who's hot. Hot on our heels as well with 50 points. Hatay with 49. Fatih Karagumruk with 47. So not quite within reach there. But Hatay and Antalya are both within reach from behind now. Galatasaray, for anyone who's curious, is down still in 12th place with 44 points. And so they're 7 points behind us at this point. Uh, only 5 matches to go. Which is important. Our next match is against Kasim Pasha. 1.30 p.m. on a Monday. April 25th is coming Monday. After that we have Kaiseri on the road. Then we're hosting Fene, who is quite hot. And then we're back in Izmir playing Guztepe and then hosting Konya to wrap things up. Konya could be playing for the title. No, I'm kidding. I, I, I really, I really seriously doubt it. But anyway, lots going on. Very exciting times uh, and suboptimal performances in the end. Not quite what we hoped for. If we had two more points and we ended this week with 53, we would be up in fifth place now, which would have been a pretty big jump from eighth last week instead of just seventh. Um, we'd be one point behind Bashaksha here, right? With with these matches left to play. Unfortunately, we're not playing Bashaksha here because that would guarantee we could kind of close that gap in one go. But they are playing Hatay next week. They're hosting them. Bashaksha here is Hatay. Then they're playing Kasim Pasha on the road. Kasim Pasha with a nice performance this week. 4-0 victory against Adana Demir. Then they're playing Galatasaray, Girasun, and Trabzon. So, nothing easy for Bajakshi here. They should be very catchable. Adana Demir, who are also still ahead of us. They have Trabzon this coming week. Then Girasun, right? Still tough. Alanya, Galatasaray, and Guzepe. Very, very catchable. Alanya Spor, still ahead of us. They have Sivas in the cup, then Sivas in the league. Tough, right? They had a good performance this week. Uh, then you've got Yeni Malatya, which that's kind of be easy points for Alanya. But then Adan Ademir, one of them has to lose, or if they draw, that could be good. Then they're playing in the cup again, and then they have Gaziantep, which, uh, and then Fatih Karagumruk. I mean, Alanya has the easiest schedule of all of us, but. I mean, it's Alanya, right? They can drop points regardless. And, and again, they're only one point ahead of us. So they only have to drop points once. We gotta win out, is what, is what I'm saying here. Uh, which won't be easy. Um, Kasim Pasha next, they've been tough lately. Then Kaiseri, that should be possible. But then of course, Fener will never be easy. Gosepe, whatever. Konya at home, I'm not particularly scared of them. But again, right, if they, if they on some weird crazy off chain, sell something to play for, that could be scary. At the very least, they could be fighting for second against Fener. So, especially if we beat Fener. <laughs> Knock on wood. But anyway, that's all I got for you this week, folks. Um, stay tuned. I'll be back next week. Um, I'm going to be watching a match this coming week, perhaps with one of our listeners out there, actually, who happens to be in New York. Um, Shouts to you, Amir. But, um, yeah, folks, I will uh, be back after that match, as per usual. Until then... Follow us on Twitter, first of all, at Eagles underscore podcast. Follow us on Instagram, Black Eagles podcast, one word. Follow myself at Sir underscore rights underscore a lot. And as always, let's go, go Besiktas! Peace out, everybody. Still plenty to play for. We got to get that conference league spot. <laughs> uh, and worth noting that fifth place spot can come to us. We still gotta try for everything we can to get as many points as possible. Peace out, everybody. Besiktas International hopes you enjoyed this program.